Tonight we have Ms. Michelle Etheridge, our health director, who will present to you a COVID-19 update. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you guys are a little further back tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just to provide a, an update, there's a little bit more information this time as we are closing in on the public health emergency coming to a close from the federal government. Um, but for Edgecombe County, um, we are now reported by DHHS as having 17,584 cases. And remember, these are just the cases that are reported. We have a lot of people that are utilizing home tests now that are not required to be reported to the health department. So we do not we do know that that number is probably a lot higher. Um, looking at the last few weeks in February, Edgecombe County, we've been averaging about eight to nine new cases a day. Um, but with that being said, the good news for Edgecombe <coughs> County is that we are in a low level, which a lot of uh, North Carolina is, so that is good news. Um, so we are in the green, so let's just hope that we can stay that way, especially with this public health emergency coming to an end. Unfortunately, we to report for deaths, we're at 177 deaths uh, for Edgecombe County due to COVID. And the biggest um, update today is looking at the fact sheet, which is all in your notes. This is the COVID-19 public health emergency transition roadmap. And of course, there's a lot of information, so I will not uh, read all of it to you, but I will do some highlights. The Department of Health and Human Services is planning for the federal public health emergency, PHE, for COVID-19 to expire at the end of the day on May 11th, 2023. So there are some things that will not be affected, um, as you can read through those notes, but there are some things that will be affected. Certain Medicare and Medicaid waivers and broad flexibilities for healthcare providers are no longer necessary and will end. CMS has used a combination of emergency authority waivers, regulations, and sub-regulatory guidance to ensure and expand access to care to give healthcare providers the flexibilities needed to help keep safe, people safe. Given the current state of COVID-19, this excess capacity will no longer be necessary. So an example would be um, during COVID-19, they had a lot of healthcare facilities that they were allowing to do telehealth. And when they were doing the telehealth, they um, lessened the regulations around HIPAA. So they were able to easily, you know, really make that easy for people to participate in telehealth. So that's one example that 
is going to go away. Those HIPAA restrictions are going to come back down hard um, and be put right back into play. So agencies that have been doing telehealth, they'll either have to um, get, you know, they'll have to get tighten up their policies and procedures or no longer provide that. So that's, that's an example of something like that. <coughs> For Medicaid, some additional COVID-19 PHE waiver and flexibilities will end on May 11th, while others will remain in place for six months. So they're pretty much just making some determination, um, looking at making sure that things are equitable. Some things will end May 11th, some things will go out six months. Um, some things, as you'll find as you read, they're going to leave it up to the state and the local government to decide how they're going to do those things. Coverage for COVID-19 testing for Americans will change also. Medicare beneficiaries who are enrolled in Part B will continue to have coverage without cost sharing the laboratory conducted COVID-19 tests when ordered by a provider, but their current access to free over-the-counter COVID-19 tests will end. Consistent with the statute on Medicare payments for over-the-counter tests set by Congress. The requirement for private insurance companies to cover, cover COVID-19 tests without cost sharing, both the over-the-counter and laboratory tests will end. However, the coverage may continue if the plans choose to. The private insurance companies can decide if they're going to continue to offer those for free or not. State Medicaid programs must provide coverage without cost sharing for COVID-19 testing until the last day of the first calendar quarter that begins one year after the last day of the COVID-19 public health emergency. So what that means is COVID-19 public health emergency ending on May 11th. This mandatory coverage will end on September 30th, 2024. And it states that the coverage may vary from state to state, and that's where they're going to be leaving some of the authority up to the state and local governments to make those decisions. Um, there is still some free COVID-19 tests that can be pulled from the strategic national stockpile. Um, we do at the health department still have some free COVID-19 home tests that we are distributing. And if we run out, we contact the state, we order, we order you know, as soon as we can. Um, but that, that'll last as long as they're sending them to us. Okay. Um, some things looking at immunizations. Reporting of COVID-19 laboratory results and immunization data to CDC will change. Um, so they're not going to be able to require these laboratories to report like they were. Okay? Um, so there's some things in the, the test results will be impacted. Calculating the daily percentage of positivity will be impacted. Um, hospital data reporting will continue as required by CMS conditions through April 30th. Um, and then that will be reduced to a lesser <coughs> frequency as well. A lot of the reports that we're getting are going to become harder to come by to get a real true accurate number. And then looking at public readiness and emergency preparedness, the PREP Act liability protections may be impacted. So when the immunizations, when the COVID uh, vaccine first came out, um, remember they pretty much said there was no, no liability, you could be held liable for something that happened. So some of these restrictions for that are going to be. Um, taken away. So unless it's under the United States government agreement, like a, a private co um, commercial company that is providing these vaccines, they're not going to be under that liability coverage anymore. So they there could be held liable. And there's a lot of other information that's in there, but those were some of, some of the highlights to point out regarding testing and immunizations um, coming forward. Like I said, we do still have free um, home tests. So the community can come over to the Human Services Building and get those daily. Looking at our um, immunization vaccine schedule for um, the health department, as you know, the boosters, as you can see here, the new booster, we, the updated one, we've only had 14% of Edgecombe County residents to get that booster. So our numbers have drastically went down. So with that being said, we no longer have a designated day for a COVID vaccine. What we've done is incorporated that into our um, clinic. So if someone who wants it, they can call Monday through Friday, get on the, the immunization schedule, and we'll give it to you that way. Um, and then our percentages really haven't changed. We're still at 52% vaccinated with at least one dose, 48% with the initial series completed, 52% with at least one of the original boosters, and like I said, 14% only with the new updated booster.
Mr. Chairman, unless you direct us otherwise, uh, you know, we have gone through this report every three months now. We won't have this report moving forward unless there are some significant changes. Well, I think it's uh, one should see the first one. I think we need to really have the record judgment in terms of what it means for the Yes, sir. Let's see about this. Here in mind, this position. At this time, we have a publication that the public petition. to my son, who's sitting back there, the back there, Roosevelt. I'm here for several reasons on tonight. Uh, I brought something to the county manager's attention earlier. Y'all remember a couple of years ago when after the flood of 99, uh, county manager Lorenzo Coleman recommended that the county not maintain those lots that were brought out into the buyout in certain jurisdictions that he felt like that the county should allow those lots to go back to their natural habitation and someday down the road be able to sell the timber off of those. I think that in any way it should be in the minutes. But out of state and the state, uh, most recently there was some land that was foreclosed out in that area by a gentleman by the name of Mr. Salburn. I think I'm pronouncing that right. But anyway, uh, he has gone out into state and state to include those lots that the county was given in the bio program and cut the timber off of those lots as well as the land that uh, he purchased through foreclosure that was never developed as a part of state and state. And I'm under the opinion that if he in fact went out there and cut that timber off that land that belongs to the county. He owed the county some money. Uh, now I understand he may have leased the land, but even if you lease land, you can't go out there and disturb it. That's just like if I go out there and lease a farm, and then I turn around and sell the top saw off to the farm because I'm leasing it, that is right, that's not right to the person that owns the land. So I don't think he was aware of it, but I was out there today and walked it myself, uh, state to state, right there to the subdivision, right before you get into speed. So that's a complaint that you bring to the board. It's something I think y'all need to look into. But I, I think it opened the door for other properties that you have leased throughout the county as well if someone else can go in, in my opinion, take advantage of you that way. Now again, the rents of problem let me know that either the other day that the county to sell the timber on that land. Yes, sir, absolutely. And the second thing, uh, yesterday marked the 58th anniversary of what they call Bloody Sunday during the civil rights movement. And now you think we need to be mindful of these things because sometimes we forget things too soon. And uh, but yesterday was the 58th anniversary. And I have asked that y'all get a document tonight. This dealing with education. It shows how on it to 1991, under the leadership of the governor, his name from, uh, okay, uh, Charles Acock, he is the governor that took education seriously for the state of North Carolina in 1901. And they said immediately he began to campaign improving the state public schools. And to those who questioned the ability of the state to finance public schools, he would reply, that we are too poor not to educate the children. 
And this is having, now, now this report here deals with the black schools. And the reason why I got this report, there was a gentleman from name from power name of Dr. Frank Weaver, who was appointed in 1962 to serve on this commission. And this is the report that they was given to work from. I mean, it's some it's some alarming stuff in the report. It, everything starts from somewhere. It shows that there was in 1921 in the first grade. The average student was five and, and, and 15 and older because you had people that were 15 years old that had never been to school. So they had to start from somewhere. But this just gives a profile of the black schools, but it say that the white schools were not much better and a lot of these schools were improved through the Rosenwald uh, school program. And the final thing I want to bring to y'all's attention, and don't y'all get scared when I lift this up, and I know my two minutes back up, this is you, Senate. You know it's up? It's by the This is Senate. Yeah, I got it. But, but this is Senate Bill 382. The one side of it, but y'all remember the other side had some information as related to Edgecombe County. And our county manager here is Native American. And it showed that Edgecombe County had a very strong population of Native Americans. And I understand November is Native American Heritage Month. I think Edgecombe County needs to go on record as putting forth a resolution in support of the contribution. Uh, they also fought in the Civil War, and we have a Native American County manager. So when, he, when that celebration come off in November, Edgecombe County needs to have a resolution. And ask, also ask for a mark of replacing Edgecombe County, so recognizing that. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, comments and for your information. Any questions or comments? Anybody else here to speak? Please come forward. Yes, sir. My name is Alvin Jamarro at 1271 Doctors Farm Road. I spoke with y'all last month, and I was seeing if there's any updates or any headway. That was on the deer hunt? Yes. Yes. Oh, go ahead. It's, it's later on. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Is it okay? Go ahead. Okay. okay. Give that report. Go ahead and give that report. You want to give that report now? Sure. All right. Just, I'm, I'm going to call Mr. Scott Kaiser, and uh, who's our director of soil and water, and Michelle Etheridge, our health director, to come forward. And Scott's going to give some background of. I gave him an early out. <laughs> Maybe they can leave early. So um, we have um, responded to our citizen complaint for what was a um, whole con a dug pit containing multiple carcasses from um, animals harvested, wild animals that have been harvested, and that's an important that's an important feature. Please, please tell us who you are. Oh. Tell the public who you are. My name is Scott Kaiser. I'm director of the Soil and Water Conservation Office here, and um, primarily experience with these sorts of things associated with mortality from confined animal operations. So I do have some experience. The um, unique situation that we are responding to is because these animals are wild and not domestic. As such, many regulatory agencies in the state that we currently deal with for confined animals and their mortality do not have jurisdiction over these things. Um, but there are some things we are concerned with. <clears throat> of course, public health being one of those. That's why the health director is involved. And then, of course, also, from my point of view, uh, water quality and groundwater, of course, as well as surface water. So, you know, if you dig a hole and bury anything, you know, over time, it has the opportunity to find its way into the groundwater. So a high concentration of anything buried that has the potential to um, contaminate groundwater is, of course, a concern to myself, my office, and of course, all citizens here in our county. Um, so uh, with that knowledge, I made contact with also the Division of Water Quality with the state of North Carolina. They did dispatch an agent out who um, evaluated, somewhat evaluated the area, and they are not interested at this time 
in pursuing any sort of regulatory action, so any sort of ticketing or anything along those lines. But um, they are putting this gentleman on their um, inspection or evaluation list, so um, they are anticipating him to not have any more production of these carcasses until, of course, hunting season returns because he does take people out deer hunting. And then uh, when such time comes, they are interested then in trying to inspect and ensure that he is handling and disposing of these animals properly at that time and not in a way that affects groundwater. They don't, they're not really concerned about how it smells. They're not really concerned about how it looks. What they are concerned about is whether or not it um, has any sort of contamination that could affect groundwater or surface water. Good evening again. I'm Michelle Etheridge, um, the health director for Edgecombe County. Um, we all came together and met, Scott, um, Eric, and I. And so we, our um, environmental health supervisor, Melanie Hudson, come as well. And in talking about this um, outfitter, we also come to find out that he also lodges people. They come, they stay there. Um, at the time, we were hearing that they're eating there, they're you know staying there for a few days. And so then we're thinking, okay, so big is this inspection need to be so then um, Melanie sent out a couple of her people um, that work for environmental health and come to find out people do stay there they bring their own food there is no water um, that is being contaminated from the site that he has um, they looked at where the dig was making sure that it was covered up adequately um, and then what they have done is moving forward anytime he wants to put a tent out there They've given them the regulations on how it has to properly be done. Scott has provided that. Um, and that for us to come out to look at that location to make sure that it is not going to contaminate any area. And he, the um, gentleman has been very cooperative. He has agreed to put more dirt over the area. Um, and that's where we're at right now. Oh, from the standpoint of, let's say, hunting season. Lots of there's lots of odors out there. So just, you know, as we move forward, we have to recognize that um, an offensive odor from a situation such as this could also be confused with an offensive odor from possibly a swine production facility or um, a poultry production facility in our county. And just um, so odors are very difficult, I would say, to regulate. From an ordinance standpoint. So how, how does that, well, I guess you said that they're only concerned with the water. So the air quality means nothing. Well, I, I don't want to step up, Scott. No. I think, Rip, not that there wasn't any concern, that's not their purview of, no. of their regulatory authority. Oh, okay. I, I do okay. feel like, as Scott mentioned, it was very difficult to regulate smells oh, okay. in general. I think that. If he complies with the guidance that has been given as far as properly covering that on a daily basis, I think a byproduct of that, it should, I'm not going to say totally remedy that issue, but drastically improve that. I, I, I understand where you're headed with this in terms of, in terms of with the mistake that said it was inspected. We would inspect it. Those things were not in place. Okay. Say that he um, 
we've, we've only had conversations, of course, in the new year as it started, but uh, he's very compliant so far and willing to do uh, whatever it takes to be neighborly and uh, you know, uh, alleviate the neighbors from this uh, nuisance. And that's what we want. Okay. And you all are on top of it, and the neighbors know they can come back. Um, not saying that we can eliminate all of the odors. And would encourage the neighbors that if next season that they encounter this again to let us know because they will know it before we do right and that's what we encourage the neighbors to do um, um, also understanding what you have heard the neighbors heard the same thing we've heard in terms of if, 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 if you neighbors consider it get out of hand you know you come back to us and we certainly will send our staff to make sure that they are compliant with what we can what we can enforce. Yes. We make sure they're compliant with what we can enforce. Any questions from the neighbor? I'll just like the words. Well, I, I think what I, I, I do think that the fact that you have come, the fact that staff has been involved, and the fact that the state has been there, there is a mechanism in place that will cause compliance with what we can what we can enforce. Yes, sir. I, I really appreciate all of y'all done and everything, but when it gets to where I can't live there, I mean, every morning I walk outside and they like throw up. It makes me nauseous. It makes my wife nauseous. I can't go outside to cook, and it stinks in the <coughs> so bad. It's just, and he's compliant now. He's always been trying to help, but he doesn't ever do anything. Well, I does, think it's like a broken record. You keep hearing the same thing. Well, I think with we have the weight of it. We, have, we do have the weight of inspections. Uh, I think we I think we should see it a different level. When you've got an environmental issue, you've got an environmental officer and our soil conservation. That, um, there's weight for inspections there, okay? okay? And depending upon what they evaluate, they can make a determination of what they have at that time. Do I need to come back when I start having the smell? Wait till the first well, one. I, or yes, uh, I, I need to contact. I can say you, you can always come back and talk to the manager, and he certainly will, will direct staff. And if we need to call the state back, um, uh, I think we'll do that. But, I, but also, what what you also hear is that um, there, a, there has to be a tolerance for some of us out there because we they, 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 that's what you hear. Some color. So I think I think you should see something different now that we've got all these agencies involved. Okay. Mr. Chairman, can I ask a question just please, to please. clarify? Are, are you experiencing that now? Do you smell it now? Have you been since? Yes, sir, it's gone. Okay. We covered the pit up and it's gone. Got it smells gone, but it took until a couple of weeks after the first year before it was completely gone. Right. So I had people come over and go, I could what I'm hearing from them, you know, there's some requirement on when you put those compasses in there, you recover. That's okay. right. That's right. Which might not have happened That's correct. Uh, initially. So That's when correct. those compasses are put in now, I'm hearing that when they're put in, they've got to recover. So that, that odor should be eliminated. And if inspectors go out and those compasses are not covered, they got some violations. That's right. And environmental penalties become, typically on take can become very expensive, okay? So I'm saying that that's what I'm hearing, that we've got some enforcement, so if the caucuses are not covered, but they can be there, they can put those caucuses in there, but they have some compliance beyond that. And what I believe I'm hearing is that compliance was not there. They might leave them there for a couple of days until they decay and we will get that over. And that should not be the case in the future. That's what I think I'm hearing. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. But if I don't have, I can give it off. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I want to inject a little bit because I, I also had a discussion with him about this, and I, I, I'm not in the cards and I also have to speak to Mr. Evans and his young experience with his father's farm. I cautioned him that he needs to put at least two or three feet of dirt over that pit every time he covered up, and he did assure me that he would do that next fall. He's doing an attempt to try to stop anything. 
um, of what will happen and when we'll not going to know the fall. Yeah, it, it, it's, I've been dealing with it for five years and I've got to talk to him. It's not like, you know, maybe he'll listen this time. Of course, it's, 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 a, it's a different thing than talking to a neighbor than talking to somebody that got something to do with what they're doing. Well, you did the right thing in letting us right, know because right. this is a big county. Otherwise, we yeah. yeah. I'm uh, and, and and the authority of the health director is strong. Okay, the health director yeah. has, 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 has a strong authority. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And I'm not the only one that probably might have this problem. You know, you go to anywhere in Edgecombe County, all of a sudden start dumping piles of guts, and you can go right side of housing development. There's nothing. You, you see what I'm saying? I was just trying to protect not just me, but everybody else. And we appreciate you bringing the issue. And uh, you're there, you can monitor that, make sure that we call and we will get our kids off staff involved to protect that community. All right. Well, thank you all. Thank you thank for coming. You. Thank you. Thanks, staff. Mm -hmm. right. Is there anybody else here to speak at public? Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, Go ahead. 127 Midway Lane, Tarver. I guess I can use that address tonight because so Roosevelt used it one time. And uh, my mailing address is P.O. Box 1391, Pine Top, North Carolina. I live three miles out of Pine Top, seven miles out of Tarver. I live on the same highway adjacent to 111, 122, where the bridge is out. Um, I know DOT. Handle that, but could this board give out some kind of information? I have some checked on today, but I like for it to come from people in other places and then I share it from them because, like you said, it gets heavy when somebody is in position like they were a while ago. Mm -hmm. So, if you could, and the people still, um, I, put, I went down today and posted some pictures and said, like, they're on target and they are they're looking good. I can see from one side of the bridge to the other now, but uh, if you could. Give out some kind of information, um, uh, if not tonight, but to the media, so people know that it's on the way. Because it's been three years, and um, people are ready. I know I am, because I have to go all around Pine Top to get mm -hmm. Pine Top. I've been by my my daddy lived in a home house, and I've been by my home house more times than I live live there, and I'm 60 years old. But I have a problem with that because I, I stopped by my daddy's house. But but um, yeah, just if you could give a report, not tonight, but sometime. In the future. Like I said, I got the dates, and I feel like my information, my resources, I got several resources, and I think they all caught it, but I would love for you all to put it out. Okay, I, I shared one that went with um, Mr. Dancy, and I, we have a meeting just last week, and I asked that same question concerning your area. 97. I asked over there where I'm at, <laughs> and 97, I asked that question every time we meet. And I, my, um, they told me on last Tuesday that they were on target and they their projected date was somewhere at the end of March, April, and they were still on target. I got that from the DOT people who said it. So hopefully that will help. I did leave that out because I work for people who live on 97 and they complain about that too. I got and it. people Dash come to me. All them. Oh, yeah. All the bridges. Well, there were nine bridges. I got one was March and one is April. I'm not going to give you the extra date. Yes, sir. Four places. Sir, you're Yes, sir. Good evening. I'm Bruce Edwards. I reside at 1014 South Irish North 22 in Harbor. I have something scheduled later on the agenda, but what Ms. Edwards and Mr. Kaiser addressed a while ago, um, I'm president of the Hunt Club, and worked out, what worked out for us was a GFL container. Our water table was so high where our clubhouse is located that we couldn't dig fence. But GFL will drop a container on it. has a top on it and have a line. And we put lime on top of it, which greatly reduces the smell. And they can sit anywhere. Um, they build us like 120 a month only during hunting season. And during all season, they let us sit there and don't charge us anything for it. So they haul it away already. They, they come every week. Um, the quicker you get it out of there, the less smell. Um, the fresher the deer are, the less smell you have. So every week they come, take it, dispose of it lawfully, and they bring another container in that's fresh. Well, I think that's an option that the landowner can decide whether that might be. 
if you talk to them, that might be a suggestion that yeah. I, that worked with us. That was the it was. Yeah. It works with us. We're right behind uh, a house and a trailer park, and we get no complaints. But they come and get it every week for us. That's an option. And Miss Edwards' staff shared that as an option. Thank you. I, I didn't want that to go without. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Is there anybody else here to speak at publication? Here are none. Uh, moving on to other business. Uh, first, Mr. Chairman, you have uh, a number of budget amendments uh, in your packet. There are a few for your approval. The rest are for um, information. Uh, budget amendment number one. Um, this is, uh, these are state transportation funds that we received through our Department of Social Services. These are funds we received last fiscal year that we need to roll those forward to the current fiscal year. Uh, budget amendment uh, number two, you'll see we are moving uh, some money within, uh, in water and sewer to water purchases. Uh, what we budgeted for what water purchases has been more than anticipated um, and so we're requesting a budget amendment to move that money uh, later on under staff reports you'll hear a little bit about some of the progress uh, that that the team has made in identifying some of the causes of, of the water loss um, item budget amendment number three i will ask that you hold that that is pertaining to another agenda item a little bit further down in the agenda uh, number four budget amendment number four um, there was money already appropriated for the purchase of uh, for trucks uh, ambulances in, uh, in emergency <laughs> services including upfit um, there are some computers the computer units that go in those need to be replaced um, just for our reporting purposes, those are more appropriate to be budgeted under office supplies where we normally put the computer equipment. So we're asking you to uh, entertain a budget amendment to move that out of capital outlay into office supplies. Budget amendment 4.1, uh, if you will, ask that you hold that until uh, a, another agenda item a little later and as well as 4.2 if you'll hold that until a little bit further in the agenda. So at this point, I'm asking if you will consider approving budget amendments one, two, and four. Um, uh, question. All in favor, let me know my vote time. Aye. Aye. All opposed? Item C is regarding our personnel policy uh, recommended amendment. Currently, our personnel policy states that when an employee goes into leave without pay, that he or she becomes responsible for paying both the employer and employee share of the health insurance premium. It has been our practice to allow a 30-day grace period before that payment is due from the employee. However, that provision is not currently captured in our policy. I propose the addition of the language shown in red in the attached e excerpt from our personnel policy to codify our current practice. Um, we have the uh, language in the agenda. Is there a motion to approve? Second. Question. All in favor, let me know by the vote sign aye. Item C is regarding a franchise agreement application submitted by KRD Transport. Uh, Mr. Kenneth Drawn, who's the owner of KRD Transit, has submitted a franchise agreement to provide uh, non-emergency ambulance transportation for the county. Um, it has been reviewed. Um, uh, Mr. Brown, our emergency service director, has met with the applicant uh, a few times to, to discuss this and review his application. Uh, he ultimately, he, he has to get a, a license from the state to provide this service, but we first, you as a board first, has to, you have to take action. You have to have this. This yes, first. Right. Yes, sir. So the recommended action tonight is to um, approve a franchise um, for KRD uh, transport, and then that be contingent on him getting final certification from the state. Motion. 
questions? All in favor, let me know by the vote of sign aye. Aye. All opposed? And the is approved. Okay. Item D is our uh, annual agreement with uh, North Carolina Division of Vocational Rehab Services. As you know, we enter an agreement into an agreement with the North Carolina Division of Vocational Rehabilitation Services to assist eligible individuals in gaining employment. These services include counseling, training, education, transportation, job placement, assistive, assistive technology, and other support services. For those services, the county provides matching funds, which for next fiscal year will be $20,759. We also provide office space for their staff here in our building. I recommend that you approve the attached agreement and authorize the chairman to execute the motion. Is there any questions? All in favor, let me know by vote sign aye. aye. All opposed. Okay. Item E is uh, health department fees. As you know, uh, our staff and health department regularly review our fees uh, based on what is allowable under uh, Medicare, Medicaid reimbursement as well as what the costs are to, um, to us in providing those services. You have a list of a, a number of uh, fees that we're proposing changes. This has gone before your, uh, our Human Services Board, and they have uh, voted unanimously to recommend that you approve. Motion? Okay. Questions? I have one question for the Why are we significantly higher than the other counties on this? Uh, Ms. Edwards can correct me if I'm wrong. I, I believe that those counties realize that they are behind in updating their fees as well. They don't do them as regularly as we do. That'd be correct. And COVID has, um, COVID has delayed many counties from doing so, so they're still going to be Item F is regarding our opioid, uh, current opioid settlement funds. Um, as you know, we have received our first two of the 18-year opioid settlement distributions, uh, which total $330,166. You previously approved our recommended plan of action, which came from the list of eligible activities. Our core committee, and core stands for Coordinated Opiate Recovery Effort, have recommended that we choose the four, these four categories, which include evidence-based addiction treatment, recovery support services, syringe service, uh, syringe service program, and the naloxone distribution. The recovery support services category included a plan to hire two peer support specialists. The committee has since revised its recommendation to instead hire and deploy a community paramedic who will provide community-based health care with, with a focus on opioid overdoses. Staff will provide more details uh, if, if you'd like tonight. Uh, I agree with their plan and recommend that you take separate actions first to approve the accompanying budget amendment, which was budget amendment number three, um, which realigns with the revised plan. And then second action to approve the community paramedic job description and revise the plan to include it at a grade 18. So again, Ms. Etheridge is here tonight, as well as Chad Eason, who is our EMS coordinator, and um, happy to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, and, uh, before we get a motion, any questions for the board? One question. Go ahead. Can you explain the program of the Serenity Service Program? Sure. Well, I'm sorry, can you repeat your can question? You explain the Serenity Service Program? So, um, the health department has a safe syringe exchange program um, that we've had now for been about since 2019, um, and then COVID has obviously put a, a big damper on that. Um, so, the sur safe syringe exchange program is where someone in the community that is um, <coughs> uses needles um, for drug use can come in and bring used needles um, in a safety container and they can exchange them for clean <coughs> needles. So when they come in, they come up and they meet with one of our nurses. 
to about you know talks to him about um, how to safely use them, um, and also tries to get them into um, see one of our doctors in case they need you know further treatment. We also try to link them to treatment. We provide them with resources, and then while they're with us, we try to get them an appointment or try to see them that day if they have some other needs that they have. Um, they're not required to do that, um, but it is a way to keep dirty needles off the um, off the streets. And so when we had come and asked for permission, we did a lot of evidence-based research, um, and, and that is how we came to have this program in the health department. From that, we were looking for ways um, to expand that and go out to in the community and going out to the areas where um, we can meet the needs of that population. And so we are actually working with Carolina Family Medical um, Center, Freedom Hill. They have an MAT, which is a Medicaid treatment program and they want to collaborate with us to be an extension of our storage exchange program and to um, offer that service at their health care facility as well. One, one question right here. Chad, if you come up and, and give you all a sort of summarized description of what a community paramedic does. But just to add what Michelle says, one of the things, uh, and we are hesitant about adding positions with a grant, this is an 18 year funding that we're going to get. We've just gotten the first two years. And so we do have a much longer runway to, to, to work with the program to see how we might be sustainable. Good evening. My name is Chad Eason. I'm the EMS coordinator for Edgecombe County. Um, so, just give a little history about myself. I've been a paramedic for over 12 years. I've been in our system or this system in Edgecombe County for public service for over 20 years, actually over 21 years in this county. Uh, this is a brief, brief overview. Uh, community paramedicine is something that's uh, in the last 10 years have been created through agencies to try to get out in the community. We get called as an EMS side of, as emergency. A lot of a lot of calls that we have are not emergencies, so they're non-emergent. Uh, some of these things we can cut down on that call volume also with community paramedicine. Uh, our primary focus would be opioid addiction and trying to keep um, them off of drugs, get them involved in the MAT programs. Eventually, when we have uh, when we create programs in the community paramedicine, we want to be a uh, MAT provider. Um, med uh, medication assistance therapy so we can provide that to them also um, but that's something we're working towards the first start first step is to get on the ground and get the, the medic in those um, homes and see those patients there's a lot of things we're working on as referrals how to get referrals meaning how do we get the patients uh, one of the um, programs you mentioned uh, the MAP program and stuff like that from Freedom Hill we would receive referrals to those to go visit uh, as uh, the community paramedic would and from the hospital, from the ED, uh, from uh, EMS side of it, if we go to a home and we follow up with the uh, patients that we have administered Narcan or something like that. Um, to just give you uh, some quick notes, uh, we've talked about Narcan is, Narcan is the reversal of opioids. So most people that are overdosing um, now it's not just heroin, it's mixed with fentanyl. Uh, fentanyl is, you know, the, the heroin's laced with fentanyl or they're taking fentanyl. Um, and that's what Narcan reverses. That's the easy way to explain how Narcan works. We give it either uh, IV, IN, which is intranasally, um, and it basically reverses their reaction. So if they're not breathing, it kind of binds to the receptors and it uh, lets them breathe and everything. So over in two months, 
we have 33 overdoses in this county. So it's two months. So, okay. uh, so that's 23 patients. So that being said, it means that we went to uh, the same patient multiple times. And so creating a system like this in community paramedicine, we hopefully will be able to show numbers in the future that we are not responding back to the same individuals. We get them uh, scheduled into the MAC program, or get them scheduled with Freedom Hill, or Rocky Mount, or Rehab, or some kind of type of facility like that, we can follow up with them and provide that for them. Uh, it, is a, it is a big concern in every county. That's why they have the O-Cord funding and uh, resources like that, because it is a issue, it is a pandemic itself. Uh, so potentially we have also 40, 42 calls that we have responded to that we deem that they were uh, overdoses. So as in we went to the call and then now we may have got toned out or responded to a sick call or unconscious and we deemed it. So that's so 42 calls in two months, you multiply that as 252 patients that we possibly could see in a year that we could follow up on. Um, there's grades of avenues that we can pursue with community paramedicine, it's just not overdose. That would be a primary focus. Secondary focuses would be uh, responding to like 911 calls that are non-urgent, and maybe it's a, a fall call initially that they just need help assisting. We we'll get there, and maybe it's an elderly uh, female or uh, male gentleman, and it's a rug issue. It's trying to educate the public and uh, what safety issues that we can create and cut down on 911 calls. Uh, improving access to providers to meet community primary care needs. Um, some of these people don't have access to transportation or anything like that, so we can follow up with somebody that goes to the hospital or ED, request us to be uh, sent over there or, or evaluate, follow up, and we can follow up with them and uh, provide that care. Mental health is a big issue. Everybody should know uh, it's a very big issue too. So later on, these are things, secondary focuses that we're focused on after, you know, before stuff is set. Uh, we have a lot of diabetic patients in uh, Edgecombe County. We also have a lot of renal failure patients, which is uh, dialysis patients. So those are some of the things that we want to follow up on is to provide that uh, follow-up care for them. Yeah, question? I don't have any questions, but I guess y'all have already thought about a way to take this community para paramedic and integrate the safest calls. Budget amendment number three. Budget amendment number three. Second questions. All in favor, let me know by vote. Aye. Aye. All opposed. And none. Approved. Is there a motion to approve the community paramedic dog prescription or advised case plan to include it at grade 18? Yes. Questions. All in favor, let me know by vote. Aye. Aye. All opposed. Here are none. supplemental agreement for additional opioid settlement funds. Um, the North Carolina Department of Justice recently announced new op opioid settlements with five pharmacies. You'll recall the first settlement was, was uh, pertaining to the drug manufacturers. Uh, these settlements will result in an additional $600 million to North Carolina state and local governments and almost doubling our settlement fund allocation. The distribution will mirror the original settlement agreement with campus. However, to participate, you must approve the attached resolution. I recommend that you approve the enclosed resolution which will authorize me to execute the documents related to the settlement. Motion? Any questions? All in favor, let me know by the vote sign aye. Aye. All opposed? Item H is uh, ARPA related uh, or ARPA required policies. The American Rescue Plan Act or ARPA requires certain policies to comply with federal funding provisions. These policies include uh, 
uh, number one, the eligible use policy for expenditure of ARPA funds. Number two, allowable costs and cost principles policy. Number three, records and retention policy. Number four, non-discrimination policy. And number five, conflict of interest policy. I will note is, is you, some of these sound familiar because we have these policies already, but uh, federal programs require that you have policies specific to that funding source. And so that's why we're bringing these to you. I recommend that you approve these um, policies as presented. Second. Question. All in favor of the nominee, sign aye. Aye. All opposed? Karen, nominee is approved. Uh, item I, this is regarding request from uh, for hunting lease for county owned property. Uh, we received a request from New Hope Hunting Club to lease 283 acres of county owned property for hunting. It includes property behind the QVC and next to our landfill on Colonial Road. The offer is a one year lease at $20 per acre. Staff has researched hunting leases in the county and found this to be in the range of leases for similar properties. I recommend that you approve the lease and authorize me to execute a lease agreement. Motion. Questions. Another question. Go right ahead. property that the county owns just behind corn. That was our first time doing that and that was because the request came to the county un unsolicited. Um, this request came to the county unsolicited. I do recommend that in the future we handle this similar to the way that we handle our farmland lease. That's what I'm getting at. Yes, sir. We're giving these but I think we have established a practice at this point. So you don't think we need a written policy? Well, it, it, I mean, it, it's a term of the first lease, and I anticipate it will be a term of this lease also. I'm sure it will, it will be required in that way. But as long as we don't need a policy, I don't think we should leave anything up. Thank you. All right. Just for the board of the lease, Mr. Evans and I have had to do some of this in terms of how we would do forward. Okay. Says that we do have a no process. Okay. Did, did, we, did we get a, you want you got a comment? No. Okay. Anybody else? Did we get a motion? Did I get a motion? Any more questions or comments? All in favor, let me know about the motion. Aye. 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 All opposed? Karen, none of this approved. Okay. Um, item J regarding the response to our FY22 <laughs> audit findings. Um, the local government commission requires that the auditor identifies financial performance indicators of concern, FPIC. Uh, we are required to then respond to those within 60 days of the audit being presented to you. You'll recall when it was presented at your uh, February meeting, the auditor pointed out those things and noted to you that you had to respond to that within 60 days. So in close, you'll find our response to the two areas of concern identified in that. Uh, I recommend that you approve the response and sign accordingly. Also want to note, uh, last month there is the, the LGC also um, required of what they call a physical accountability agreement, and you signed that at, at the last meeting. They revised that. They added one more provision 
which was in actually last year's agreement. I was a little surprised when it wasn't first in there. And that was a provision that we have to submit a draft, a draft copy of our next year's budget by May 15th, I believe it is. And so that has been revised. So before you leave tonight, we'll circulate that because all of you will have to sign both of these uh, documents. So, but I do recommend that you approve the response to the uh, financial performance indicators of concern. Is that motion approved? So moved. Second. Question. All in favor, let it be known by the vote sign. Aye. Aye. All opposed. Item K, regarding the job description for Public Health Nurse 3. To better suit the needs of the Health Department, uh, Ms. Etheridge, our Health Director, has recommended the revision of the Public Health Nurse 3 position. The revision adds communicable disease, tuberculosis, and HIV, STDs responsibilities to the position. The position will remain at grade 20. I recommend that you approve the revised job description as presented. So we currently have two communal disease positions that are vacant. They remain vacant. We have um, an employee that was our maternity coordinator, and we have since had to um, re uh, we're assuring maternity services with um, total women's care. Doctor school left because we that they don't have a position that they can send down to see the patients at our facility. Those patients to them. With that being said, there is some there is some follow up she's doing there. She has all along, in addition to maternity, has been doing the TV, the CV, um, and seeing patients in the clinic as well. Um, and so, and we have not had any applicants for the CV positions. That, <coughs> as you know, field diseases is our biggest program. It's not unfortunately not going anywhere. Um, and so, what I'm trying to do is have a position that would be able to address. Our needs. We have a TV nurse position vacant. We have two CV nurse positions vacant. Um, we have two nurses that are currently working on all of that. And so we're trying to restructure this position to move that employee into to make sure that all that is covered. Any other questions? regarding uh, the town of Princeville's plan to expand their extraterritorial extra jurisdiction of the ATJ. I, I want to note that I was under the impression that, that, the, that the town board had already voted to approve expanding their ETJ. They did. They tabled that and they're, going, they're moving forward to a future meeting. So uh, I ask that you not call for the public hearing at this time. Uh, I'll if they do in fact take action on that and they have to approve that, I'll bring it back to you next month to call for a public hearing at uh, following months. Next. Um, item M is um, consideration of calling for uh, convening your board of equalization and review. Um, do request that you call for that to convene at your April meeting, Monday, April 3rd at 7 p.m. and to adjourn Monday, May 1st um, meeting. You do have at your place, uh, our tech administrator, Ms. Lewis, um, has provided you a copy of, of the manual at your seat. But I do recommend that you call for the convening of your Board of Equalization and Review uh, for April 3rd. The motion is to call for the convening of the Board of Equalization Equalization and Review. At the April what meeting? Third. At the April third meeting. Is there such a motion? Second. Questions? All in favor let it be known by the vote sign aye. Aye. All opposed. And none the 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 convening is called. Thanks. Next. Uh, item N is regarding four state grant projects that we are receiving from the appropriation from the General Assembly through the Office of uh, State Budget. Uh, we've been approved for funding for these four projects. You have a brief description. I'm going to invite uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Best to come forward, and she's going to review 
briefly um, these four projects and what they're intended to do. Excuse me, as Mr. Evans mentioned, we have received um, funding for four projects um, and we will be giving you a, a more um, expanded description as the retreat next week, but I do want to give you a brief summary of those projects. Um, the first was for the uh, a million dollars for the costs that were associated with the QVC fire to include reimbursing the county for direct costs of responding to the fire, which included supplies, equipment, real, um, contracted services, et cetera. Um, and the remaining of that one million is the um, decrease in tax value that the county suffered from the loss of that structure. Um, the uh, second project was for $250,000 for support for the county to support the QVC employee support program. The United Way of the Tar River Region uses these funds to administer a support program which provides rent, mortgage, and utilities to former QVC employees. There is a limit of $1,200 per, per employee and payments from this fund are made directly to the vendor and not to the, um, to the person. The third project was for community facilities development, which includes the uh, needs assessment for the Leggett, um, proposed Leggett Fire Station land acquisition costs for, for the Leggett Fire Station, and also the pre-development and site preparation costs. Um, this project, the third project, also includes um, the development of an evidence processing and storage facil facility, um, again, for the needs assessment for that structure. And then, of course, the construction costs of the new Edgecombe County Animal Shelter, um, $775,000 towards that estimated cost of $1.5 million. And the fourth project is for fire and, the, I'm sorry, the fourth um, funding source is for fire and rescue equipment at Kingsborough, and that's $1.5 million to purchase two fire trucks, a tanker, air packs, and equipment for trucks um, to provide for better fire protection in that area. So this is an appropriation to the county, and the intent of the appropriation is for the county to purchase this equipment. And so, um, and we'll get into this a little bit more detail at your retreat. Uh, the plan is for the county, as you, as you know, last year's retreat presentation was done to talk about um, what would it take to have fully trained, fully paid, 24-hour fire protection coverage. And we looked at that, it was a pretty big number. Um, so, um, some members of the General Assembly were aware of, obviously, that the fire at QVC and wanted to assist um, with that, and so they have appropriated this to purchase two trucks and some related equipment. So, uh, it'll probably be a year from the time that we order this equipment at the time that we get it. So, in the meantime, we're going to be exploring a uh, possible option of us hiring at least a couple of staff to work uh, a shift to supplement and to assist the fire protection in that area, not for the full district, but for Kingsborough in particular. I think we would have to have some conversation yes. in terms of how the, how the fire protection service is used to work in that area. And, and I think we've come to the conclusion that it needs to be So, so we're also exploring, uh, you've heard us talk about possibly building what we're calling a regional emergency operations center at Kingsburg. Oh. And this would be a, a building that could house um, uh, fire uh, equipment, the trucks and staff. Mm -hmm. We could have uh, a rescue squad stationed there. Um, we could also have, if we have some big event, it could be our multi-county emergency operations center where we have multiple counties working together to uh, respond. Also that we can do training, work with the community college to do training for first responder type of training.
training. Now we have um, we've been looking at the possible layout of that, the cost of that, and right now we are planning to pursue funding for that as a part of um, the package for Kingsborough Industrial Park if we are able to land a big client. It's an ongoing conversation. Absolutely, and, and there will be, uh, there have been brief conversations about that. There will be more in-depth conversations. Right now, the plan is not to overtake their district. Um, the plan is to help our, one of our main concerns right now is having full-time staff right there for, you know, the industrial class that we already have, and we hope to have that whole park full within the next three or four years. And we see it as, a, you used a good word, a, a partnership, that it could be a partnership between our efforts and our as the service that exists now will not cover the standards used to be projected. And what we want to do is expand the level of service in that area so that it can cover the entire community. <coughs> and and, and that they have the capability of, of handling a situation such as happened at PBC. I think that was the intent of the equipment, additional equipment, and the intent and the ongoing discussions. I think Right now, the funding for this equipment we have in hand, this million and a half dollars, we have this in hand. Well, from an economic development, go ahead. Are we extending it to buy trucks? Yes, mm -hmm. Truck, two trucks. And, they, and, and part other. of the question is, are they gonna be put at our seat? No. Right now, the intent is we hope to pursue building this building that we just discussed. Yes, but if we have the money in hand and we intend to buy trucks, where are they going while they are before that building is as I mentioned it'll by from the date that we order it'll be a year at least before we get these trucks so we have we have a little bit of a lead time to be able to work those details out <laughs> good question sir. Good question. I'm assuming there's no time frame necessarily on the grant for this particular one uh, it is um, I think is funding have we talked about funding for the remainder of the Leggett fire station how that is going to be funded and built um, the hope is that there seems to be some interest from members of the general assembly that the state may fund that they want to see a plan first before they will entertain that which is why they and, and, and that also goes for the sheriff's evidence storage facility and then the animal shelter We match on that one, yes. We'll be matched by the county. Do we be asking for that in our budget for this coming year? Yes, that, that's gonna be the plan. So as you know right now, originally this money also included <coughs> doing a needs assessment architectural design for the animal shelter. We already had that covered in our budget. That, that was already underway. So we went back and asked, can we use the balance of this to put in the construction of the animal shelter? And they agreed. So it's now part part of this um, this grant agreement. So we're further along with the animal shelter than we thought we would be. That's right. Based on this money coming to me. That's right. Yeah. So we they are just about finished with the design of the building to the not design, but the concept enough to have a, a, a good estimate. The next step will be for us to bid that out to see what the actual number is going to be. We know we got 775,000. Depending on what that number is, then we'll I'll come back with with a recommendation to either to finance or pay for that out of uh, fund balance or to finance that depending on that cost. We don't know what that cost is at this point right now, and so 
I'll have to withhold my recommendation on how to fund it. I do expect to have that information in time enough to make that recommendation as a part of next year's budget. There are a couple other things I want to point out about this. Um, so the, the first million dollars, which is forty-some thousand dollars of uh, reimbursing us for our direct expense to responding to the fire at QVC, the balance of that to help make up for the revenue we've lost from their loss in value. Um, so that's that's a million dollars. That's very flexible money. It could be put in fund balance if if you so choose to. What I'm recommending that you do is, you'll recall, you agreed to set aside part of our ARPA funds to replace the roof on the detention center. Um, we've had an architect to look at that and give us a rough estimate of that, and estimating would be much more than we anticipated. So it's estimating to cost somewhere between a million and a half and two million dollars. That roof is something that you know, we've been patching a little bit here and there because it's a big ticket item. We've kind of been kicking that can down the road. We were hoping that ARPA would help us to go ahead, and it is, there's still money there to do that, but it's costing a lot more than we expected. My recommendation is to apply, um, is to apply, add that, this million dollar from state appropriation with the balance of what we have from ARPA funds and budget that for uh, replacing the roof at the detention center. So you'll see in budget amendment 4.1, which you looked at a moment ago, that budget amendment right now that 577,000 as a change sits in uh, capital improvement in our maintenance department. This budget amendment is uh, moving that into uh, a separate fund. We're setting up a multi-year fund, project fund, um, for this project, if, if you agree with this. So it would be adding uh, the, the million dollars from that to this. We won't do that this year. We won't, we won't start on that because we've got to have those bid specs prepared, bid out, and it just is no time for that. We don't expect to begin this fiscal year. So um, you'll see that you have behind attachment 15, um, you have, um, you have uh, some budget ordinances to set those budgets up. So first thing, I'm, I'm recommending that we use a million, this million dollars, that first million dollars to go alongside with the ARPA funds we have so that we can go ahead and plan to redo the roof at the detention center. The second budget amendment, which was 4.2 that I asked you to hold a few minutes ago, would be appropriating at $250,000 into a line so that we can, um, we will do um, a cooperative agreement with United Way, and then they will administer those funds. That's for the QB, the assistance fund for former QB, QVC employees. You'll recall that they received a pretty sizable donation from QVC, as well as donations from all <coughs> over, uh, to the tune of uh, around $200,000, I think, probably more, I can't remember the exact number. And they have been assisting those former employees they still have needs that they can help to meet. They've run out of those funds. And so um, the appropriation is for us to work along with United Way to provide that. So that budget amendment 4.2 will be appropriating that into a, an expenditure line for us to, um, to work with United Way on that. So with all that said, again, the recommendation is to approve and accept these grant awards as presented the budget ordinances you have, as well as those two budget amendments, 4.1 and 4.2. Uh, uh, speaking, speaking back to the animal shelter in one second, but what you just talked about with the appropriations into that fund, that is when we do that appropriation, that is specifically tied to the detention center's roof. Yes. Like we are saying that it's tied to that when yes. we make that, it's not just tied to a fund. No, sir. We're saying that's where the roof is. Okay. And Good then, much. so we're voting on that tonight? I'm asking you to, yes. Okay. And then for the shelter, have we, I know that I've heard from the town of Tarboro that they've approached us about combining our animal shelter. Mm -hmm. Have we can explored that? I've heard that we haven't really talked too much to that. 
But as a part of this process, have we asked them to join us in building this new shelter? Well, we have, and they've, they've been at a few of the meetings. Um, uh, Mike has been overseeing that, that, and they have a committee include some of the sheriff's um, staff, Mike, um, Stan, our uh, maintenance director, and Troy Lewis, who's town manager. Has, he's, not all of the meetings, he's attended some of those meetings. So he's been very involved in that, those conversations. So when we approve this, is that does that mean that we are that seven hundred seventy five thousand we are saying is to that project we are allocating that money in balance? Right. Mm -hmm. okay. So everything on this sheet is allocated in balance as according to that framework. Yes. Another question. Yeah. Thank you, We have been talking about that. They have not given us in final because I don't think we'll get to that specific number until we know exactly what it's going to cost. You know, we've talked about how do we come to that number. We, you know, look at um, proportionate share of space, their current facility, our current facility, or proportionate share of animals that we expect them to have compared to our animals in the shelter. So there are a couple of ways we can go about doing that. Um, we've been having conversation when, by the time we come to a recommendation on how to pay for it, and that being either we pay for it up front or we finance that, we will know at that point what that figure is from, from the town. I'm just wondering, so I know Darren said the talk had a retreat when they went on the agenda. Did he talk about it? Sure. Yeah. I have a question or comment. Hearing none. So I recommend that you approve uh, accepting the four grants as presented, as well as their, the accompanying budget ordinance and two budget amendments, 4.1 and 4.2. Who makes the motion? So moved. Second. Question. All in favor, let it be known by the vote sign aye. Aye. All opposed? And then the motion is approved. Next is appointment. So, Mr. Chairman, we're going to call on Ms. Katina Braswell, our planning director, to present the planning board report. Good evening. Good evening. In review of the February planning board report, uh, planning board voted 4 to 2 to support proposed text amendment 2 to the board with a favorable recommendation. Mm -hmm. Relocation of the stormwater ordinance from the UDO to the county code of ordinances and adoption of the draft local program is to be included. Planning Board asks that the Board of Commissioners call for public hearing for both proposed text amendment and draft local program. Are there any questions? So, I was just wondering why did you vote against it? Two. You said it voted four to two? Four to two. There was some discussion as far as the access easement, the width of the easement, and I know they normally vote unanimously, but there was some extra discussion on that. We'll provide details uh, at the public hearing. Or do what? Vote? Vote. Want to get a good discussion? <laughs> yes, it will. You know, the votes are always good, okay? Mm -hmm. That's true. Uh, the recommendation calls for a public hearing on April the 30th. Is that such a motion? So moved. Second. Question. All in favor of it, no matter what time. Aye. Aye. All opposed, the public hearing. Second. Good. 
favor of the number of the votes. Aye. 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 All opposed, hear it not. This approved. Contract is clear. Next one says. Uh, we have no, we kept that as a placeholder, but we have no contracts for your approval. And no breath, no contract, there's no action. The Department of Report for review the board has received. And it's a general practice. Well, 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 We've already covered the uh, complaint about the hunting outfitter. <coughs> you do have in your agenda packet um, updated list of dates for many upcoming meetings that we have, <coughs> budget season related. I do want to point out that we did move the uh, Edgecombe School Board joint meeting to April 25th. We were originally planning to have our meeting with the Nash County School Board. That did not work for them, so we, it does work for Edgecombe Board, so we move that to April 25th. Uh, right now, we're planning to have our joint meeting with Nash School Board on May 15th. They have not yet confirmed that, so hopefully we'll be able to, to stick to that date so we can all make sure we 
mark it in our calendars, but um, otherwise, um, we, all of the rest of the dates we plan to hold. It's a budget approval date? No, we have to have a draft of our budget by the Yeah, that would be quite a difficult for us to make that. Any other things on that? Um, I will point out item D you see there, you'll recall some time back you uh, you supported um, the naming of Candy Corner. We did get notification about a month ago, I guess it was, that uh, NCDOT has approved that and they will be moving forward. I don't know, they haven't put the sign on. Okay. They'll, they'll be moving forward soon with um, with putting that sign up there at that intersection and the, the neighbors there and the, the neighborhood there are excited about that. <clears throat> um, the next one is regarding uh, a state uh, lobbyists. You'll recall that we had some uh, discussion about the county considering uh, contracting with a lobbyist or a state lobbyist or, or a firm to provide state lobbying services. Uh, we did post a request for proposals. Um, we received um, a number of uh, responses to that. We received, uh, we received five responses to that. Uh, my executive team and I, we have reviewed those proposals, and you'll see we rated them the way that we show it there. As what we're looking for tonight from you is some direction uh, as to how you would like for us to proceed. I do suggest that we interview at least the top two, maybe top three. Um, we as our executive team would be happy to do that for you. I don't know if you'd like to uh, form a committee to, re to, to do that, to do those interviews, if you'd like to you know, have some of the board members join us to do that. You know, ultimately we see this, that they do, they will you know, work and represent you as the board of commissioners. Certainly uh, we have in the proposal that Mr. Peters and I will be the main liaison between the board and the firm. Um, so we don't, we're not making a recommendation tonight on which firm to choose, but looking for some direction as to how you would like for us to proceed. Any comments on the board? <coughs> send you the RFP itself what we posted to, for, to solicit proposals because it talks about um, uh, the rating criteria that we are, we've used to, to grade these. Any other comments? Any other thing I would imagine? I'll mention that we, um, we have um, also posted a, a RFP for federal lobbying services. Um, those proposals are due back in a few days, I forget the day. Yeah, I would suggest that the same thing as a few days. Um, last thing is not on the agenda, but I do want to point out, I, I put at your place um, a proposed or draft agenda for your retreat, um, which your retreat is a, a, a week from today. It'll be next Monday the 13th. We will be meeting at the at Edgecombe Community College here in Tarboro at their Center for Innovation. That's the new building if you're facing a campus building to the far left. Uh, we'll be meeting there in their the main uh, conference meeting room there. Um, so you have before you a proposed agenda. Certainly if there's something else you'd like to see added here, anything changed, um, just you don't have to necessarily do that now, but you're welcome to, to let me know. We'll, we'll make adjustments. Questions about uh, proposed retreat agenda. Hearing none, next. 
that's it for managers. Commission, did the commission have any comments? Um, I'd like to report, uh, The town of Tarboro, our county seat, has been going through a process. They've received a brownfield grant um, for riverbank stabilization and riverbank work along the Tar River. Um, and a part of that process, they also received a rural economic transformation grant. And these, these, both of these grants, they put together it's almost two, almost a million dollars worth of site plan and, and work that's there. And they've been going through this process. I've been in those meetings. Um, and we have seen the draft proposal, and I think it's important for us to know it because we own a significant amount, and it's specific to downtown Barbara, and we own a good amount of property in downtown Barbara that we use for all our, our staff. Um, and a part of that plan is about developing the property that we own and, and how we would develop it and how the town would think we develop it. So I'd like, I think everyone in this room should know about that plan and how that works and how we can help the town achieve those goals um, and grow. Um, that's a significant grant that the town got. Um, and a part of that will be riverbank stabilization, which is vitally important to all of us. Um, and um, just economic well-being and how, that, how it all looks. So I think we should ask as that's adopted. I know they talked about it at their retreat last weekend. I think we may have talked about it. Um, and as it becomes adopted and things that we should champion that with the town about making sure that those things are implemented. The site plans and everything that they've presented is will be phenomenal if it can happen. I mean it's it's a it's a fifty year plan, but it would be great for us if we could have it happen. Yeah, I had some questions from manager. Um, I was asking, does the county have any kind of ordinances on drones? We certainly can do some, some research on that. I know they they sell these stores almost yeah, like toys. Everybody. Like, <laughs> I was like, I have no idea that I would have. Can't regulate everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other thing I was asked about was, um, you know, we've been talking about broadband. How is it the the city, the town of Carver, is about to introduce? So I think 
I was just going to say infinity link is not receiving a great grant. So great grant dictates overlap existing providers, that kind of thing. I think they're doing it just as a business investment, a business opportunity. Okay. Infinity link only has a pole attachment to the town. So all the town has said is that you're allowed to access our utility poles. Free. They're not charging them to do that. So they're not providing them with anything except saying that you can use our utility poles and we are responsible for the upkeep of them. It's the same thing that happens with the provider in the south side of the county that's doing it. He's paying an agreement per pole to attach to those poles. But the town has said that we would just want to charge them for that. And I think in the town house population, perhaps we've got a concentrated population and we can make it easier for them because we don't concentrate. Any other comments from commission? Yes, sir, Mr. Williams. Go ahead. Uh, as everybody knows, the county test is beautiful well. Uh, certainly, our sportsmen and guys that love to fish, Mr. Evans, you probably love to go with these. Uh, the wildlife landing at Old Sparta is, is just horrible, dilapidated, in, in grave need of updating. And I'm looking at my phone because I've gotten quite a calls in the last couple of weeks from sportsmen that have communicated with North Carolina Wildlife Commission way back in early 2021. And I think the last that we can document that we've been told is they may get to it in the winter of this year. I don't want to go out on a limb and sound horrible, but that's unacceptable. That wildlife landing is in such disarray that if, they, if they're not going to come and fix it, it needs to be closed. And we've been very gracious. I've made calls. I've sent emails. Mr. Evan has sent calls and emails. But in regards that many of our citizens use that, it's not safe. Uh, I, I don't know what we need to do to request again, maybe put a little pressure up the line or whatever, but it, 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 we really need to see if we can make that a better place. And we've got a new bridge coming through, we're gracious and grateful for that, but, but our, our sportsmen just need something better. And uh, you know, I went out and took pictures in a sense and they knew it to begin with, but it's just, we need to do something. Well, well we, uh, if, you, if we can have maybe I was inspection or somebody determine that it is unsafe, okay, and if we can contact, if we can do that, we can send a letter and have our manager at least communicate that to wildlife who will be responsible for the upkeep of that. We can, I would suggest that you bring that on. Would you, or let's go to that different suggestion? Let's do that for suggestion. Yes, Make a determination if we can do something. Okay. Uh, I'll start the problem with it. But if it's a state profit, I don't even know if we can make that or uh, we can we can at least maybe from our we can express our group to express our concerns about that, okay. Thank you, sir. And that's that's as a board and that's coming from the board, okay. Yes, sir. Board, okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, and have that letter prepared for us. Yes, sir. Like I said, anything else to come from the commission? If not, bring back to my attorney. Okay, now at this time, ladies and gentlemen, we're scheduled to go into a closed session to discuss a personnel matter and a legal matter. Is there a motion to go into closed session? He just needs to cite the uh, statute. Yes, go ahead. As you see in your agenda, the personnel matter is one, under 143-318.11, subsection A2. The legal matter, attorney-client privilege, is under 143-318.11, A3. And because it's pending litigation, we're required to cite the <coughs> North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services may tell in her official capacity except for those North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. Richard Rayer in his individual and former official capacity except for the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. National and Is there a motion? Second.